Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game from the Julius Bear Generation Cup. This is an online event with rapid time controls, 15 minutes plus a 10 second increment. On the white end, Hans Niemann, and he's paired against Levon Aronian. Let's have a look. There were a few things that stuck out to me about this game. The main thing is how quickly it was over. It's only a 21 mover. It also only lasted 11 minutes. It's quite rare to see a Super GM fall so fast, but at the same time, if there is going to be a quick defeat in the game, it's not surprising that it happens out of the Sicilian defense. And what are we working with in this game? A Sicilian Nidorf. Not the most common sixth move, bishop to d3, most popular, bishop e2. I think one of the ideas behind bishop to e3, bishop d3, excuse me, this does anticipate some potential pressure against e4. It does treat for the moment. And the bishop is kind of treated as if it's a pawn. Also, with the bishop on d3, uh, the queen does have the option of being deployed to e2 still, or maybe even f3 in some cases. All right, from here, black is going for some kind of hybrid of the knight orf and dragon. f3, bishop's now fiend kettoed. And when I initially skimmed through this game, there was only one move that stuck out to me as odd. And this is that move coming up. Bishop e2. Why do I think it's odd? Um, <laughs> I can't make sense of it. So fill me in. There's some deeper point behind bishop e2, so just educate me. I can't quite put my finger on the point behind this move. Moving a an already developed piece for a second time this early on. I must admit, my first imp impression was, oh, there maybe there was some tactic on d4, but I soon thereafter dismissed that. There really isn't any trick. For example, knight takes e4, unleashing the bishop on the knight, could be met with bishop takes on e4, and the queen would be there defending the knight. Moreover, what would be wrong with bishop to e3? Nothing really. That is the top suggestion by the engine. Deploy another piece. Queen bishop to its most natural square. Watches over the knight now directly. Okay. It is secure on this post as well with f3 in. There's no fear of knight g4 scaring it away. Okay. Again, somewhat of a head scratcher for me seeing this bishop to e2 move. After the game, Levon was interviewed, and when asked about the game, he one of the things he mentioned was that he thought some moves were strange. I don't know what moves he, he was talking about. I'm, I could only speculate, and I'll point out the two moves in this game I think he thought were strange. I think this is one of them. The move I thought was odd, I'm thinking he thought was odd as well. Can't say for sure. One of the reasons I think, uh, well, in addition to just having that bishop move for a second time, this was maybe the first think for Ronian. His reply to bishop to e2 didn't take a whole lot of time. Again, this is only rapid time control, but he did spend about 25 seconds with his reply. He went ahead and connected knights, whereas all the moves before that were played much more quickly. Okay, moving on. From here, play develops much more in a much more understandable way, uh, natural way, I could say. Castles, both sides have their queen bishops out. White now connects the rooks, maybe also with an eye on trading dark square bishops. Most common square now for the queen. C7 she goes. And now G4. Towards the end of the video, as I will as I often do, I'll be sharing a tale of the tape so we could see the inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders, and also one other cool new cool new feature that Leech has recently implemented, the accuracy for each side. This G4 move nearly registered as an inaccuracy. I think this is the other move that Levon thought as strange. He said strange moves. Was he thinking two or more? These are the only two I'm going to point out. Bishop e2 and g4. I can't really see anything else. I can't really describe any other ones as strange. So 
why is maybe G4 strange? And again, my initial impression, I only saw bishop to e2. G4 may be strange. He, he spent about 10% of his time, 90 seconds, with his reply. He went with knight to e5. You know, if you find a move as strange, I think you're kind of set back in your seat some, and you take some time to reflect. Okay, outside of the time factor, what is maybe strange or uncommon about the g4 move? It's not so, yeah, it's not so commonly seen, I don't believe, with the king, king's residence on the king side. This is a far more common move to see when he's over here, castled, and white is looking to push, push, push away push maybe some pieces around or maybe crack open a file for a rook, but g4 in this case is a much more committal move, we can say. g4 is played now, and you're looking to drive the king knight away from its favorite square, but you're also moving a pawn away from your king, so there's a little less shelter now for this guy. Okay. In the game, we have knight to e5. This is the of the inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders in this game, this is the first inaccuracy. There is some shift in the evaluation with knight to e5. Considered best in reply to g4 is h6. And it says that black has even a slight advantage. So this move, you know, designed to preserve the knight, kind of saying if you really would want to establish a pawn on g5 you're gonna have to weaken your king position that much more h4 is gonna have to be played and on top of that you will have to give my rook a completely open file to work with so that would that'd be a, probably a very dangerous uh, follow-up for white going with h4 and g5 okay move played in the game knight to e5 king knight is driven back White negates the knight jump, is not so quick to give this knight a push, kills this knight jump, and now this is already very, very serious. In fact, this next move is a blunder by black, and the game is over. It does go on to move 21, but this is really a game that's over by move 15. So b3 doesn't want to even see the knight arrive on c4. If it does get there, it's going to track down one of the bishops, and usually white will want to preserve the dark square bishop that is the better bishop in this environment, in this structure. White cuts that out altogether with b3. If there is some drawback behind this move, it's the weakness on c3. This is now a hole. The move played from here, e6. Defensive move, stopping knight to d5. This is a losing move, though. This does make a, a bit of a weird impression having a small pawn center with the bishop fianchettoed. It's not around to watch over uh, the weakness on d6, the hole now that it, the hole that is now present on d6. Moreover, it's not just about the d6 square, but also look at that f6 square. Two holes are created with this one move, so you kill the one jump but you create these two big weaknesses. And on top of that, we have this pawn already controlling the weakness on f6. So this is a, a bit of an odd setup by black to go with that small pawn center. What is considered best, and the move that holds an even valuation, an even evaluation for black, is to play against the weakness in white's camp, c3. So, again, this is the move played in the game. This is considered best, and I'd like to share a, the, this following variation with you because I found it very instructive. Um, with this move, rook to c8, the computer is saying, live with this knight in your house for a move. Allow the knight to go to d5. Don't take it. If you were to take it, white would have a wonderful grip over that c6 square. It says, just go back home for a move, and only a move later, drive the knight away. 
I'd like to put some more moves on that it's considered a top line. C4, E6 only now. And after the knight is driven back, you ready for this cool move? This was the main instructional point for me in this game. Uh, there is also another instructional point, but I was already familiar with this one uh, tactical sequence that's very important to know as a whether you play the white or black side in the Sicilian defense. There's a nice trick that you'll be seeing, but this is this one was new to me. The move h6 in this position. What is the point exactly? My first thought was, oh, black is able to recapture on h6. That was really bad miscalculation by me. White has enough on that h6 square. What is the point behind h6? Well, after pawn captures pawn, can you see the follow-up? Black to move, what's the follow-up here? Okay, this is what the computer has in mind. Queen h4. That is a really slick move. <laughs> this pawn is now pinned to the h-file. Pawn takes bishop, there's now a direct connection between the majors, and that would be mate. So really what this is coming down to is that with h6, black is successful with pulling this knight pawn away from its control over f6, and then black will be able to successfully get this pawn back. And this holds as a roughly even position. Still a lot of game remaining here, but... That's a cool little sequence right there. So in this game, Levon didn't even want to see this knight step foot on d5, cut that out straight away. But again, the weaknesses on d6 and f6, primarily d6, we're going to see the big problem there soon enough. Play follows with now f4. It is winning from this point on for white, f4. Rook c8 only now, counterattack against the knight. And we'll see how uh, play follows from here. But if some other move besides rook c8 is played, I mean, what else can you do? If you play knight c6, you'll see you'll end up seeing similar as to what happens in the game after this knight c6 move is in there. Um, yeah, let me just show the moves in the game from here. Rook c8 is now met with knight d to b5. Now the queen is watching over d6. This is the move. So whether it's knight simply the knight simply moving to b5 maybe sometimes the pawn will already be on b5 and you'll get a couple pawns with this sequence but this is this is crushing now knight b5 pawn takes knight knight takes pawn queen takes c knight takes d6 check king e7 and no queen exchange pawn takes knight first this is threatening now. Rook takes c7. So what does black play? Knight takes e5. This is defending against rook takes f7. But now we have queen b4. Setting up a crushing double check. Which black just allows at this point. He plays queen e2. And he must have known this was coming. Knight f5 is the final move of this game. Black resigns. This isn't one that's going to carry on for, you know, a dozen moves down the road. If there is no resignation, this is going straight to mate. Double check, the king must always move. He only has three options. If he goes to these two, it is going to be queen here, mate. And if he plays here, the queen, you know, there's a couple of ways forward. You could go here. One way or the other, the king's going to get mated with the queen on e7. So this one's over after only 21 moves, but it was over after move, well, after move 14, after e6 was played. So yeah, a very quick game and uh, a very efficient game. Let's have a look at the tail of the tape on this one. There we go. And we could see... The evaluation throughout Stockfish 15 in Stockfish 15's eyes. G4, the move that was nearly considered an inaccuracy. And then there's these huge jumps. If I just click on the inaccuracies, if I give that a click, 
we get straight to that first inaccuracy, which was the 95 move. Second accuracy is already at a point where it's way gone. So if we have a look at the blunders, clicking on the first blunder, after that E6 move, that one, when the advantage is at plus two, plus 2.1 in this case, it's over. And then what was the other blunder? Playing rook to C8. Yeah, but after really the E6 move, it's, it's a goner. The final tally with this one, inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders, you can see for each side. Average centi pawn loss, 18 for Neiman, 65 for Aronian, and the cool additional feature implemented by Lee Chess, we have a 94% accuracy for Neiman and 81 for Aronian. Anyhow, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.